and welcome to this week's Rights in Russia interview. Today, our guest is Natalia Taubina, Director of the Public Verdict Foundation, which works to combat police abuse and other human rights violations throughout the Russian Federation. A graduate of the Moscow Institute of Physics and Engineering, Natalia Taubina has worked in the field of human rights since 1992. In addition to helping victims of police abuse, she works as a trainer on international human rights protection mechanisms for NGOs and participates in a number of international forums. Natalia has been the recipient in 2013 of Human Rights Watch's Allison DeForge Award and in 2015 of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. In 2018, she received the Moscow Helsinki Group Prize for Human Rights Work. Natalia has participated over many years in developing methodology and conducting research both in Russia and abroad on various aspects of human rights, as well as evaluating the effectiveness and sustainability of nonprofit organizations. Thank you for joining us, Natalia. Given your significant experience and contributions to human rights over the years, I'm looking forward to a rich conversation. Thank you, Mary, and thank you very much for inviting me for such uh -huh. Conversation. I'm looking forward to that it's going to be uh, quite interesting. Terrific. Um, I have some questions to help guide our interview, which we hope to cover in about 30 minutes. So if you're ready, let's get started. Yeah. First question. In Russia, to what extent are human rights organizations still able to function and be effective? Uh, it's a good question and it's uh, difficult to answer in one sentence because the situation is very much different uh, from regions to regions and, for example, in Moscow there we have uh, a number of human rights organizations, uh, the situation is much easier to continue to work for continuation of our work and because we are together, we can discuss uh, different strategies how to deal with uh, such and uh, with different situation and uh, uh, different aspects of uh, legislation. But uh, in the regions, uh, in summer, there is only one human rights organization who deals, uh, for example, with such issues like torture, which are quite sensitive uh, for, for authorities. And uh, for sure, their work is quite difficult and it's very much uh, difficult to continue such work, facing almost every time and uh, on a constant basis uh, threats uh, and different type of uh, um, actions, uh, push, um, like, um, like I said, threats, physical threats, uh, or even threats to uh, initiate criminal prosecution against human rights activists almost on an everyday basis. So yeah, generally speaking, the situation is not quite friendly, I would say, for human rights, uh, in, for human rights organizations in Russia. And if uh, for big cities, there, there are a number of human rights NGOs dealing um, working in human rights area, the situation is a little bit uh, better. Uh, in regions, uh, the situation is much tough. Um, in the Western press, uh, it portrays a, a very bleak picture of human rights in Russia. And so is it really so bleak on the ground, both in the cities and in the regions? Uh, yeah, I would say that situation is uh, getting worse and worse, and this year we have uh, many new uh, legislative amendments uh, which are restricting fundamental human rights and freedoms tremendously, and uh, uh, I mean, in, in such situation, uh, it's difficult to expect, yeah. yeah. Uh, that uh, situation uh, with human rights uh, can be good. Uh, at the same time, I mean, I said about the legislation which is getting worse and worse and more and more restrictions uh, uh, regarding human rights and freedoms are enforced. At the same time, law enforcement uh, bodies are receiving more and more duties 
and uh, more and more difficult uh, to bring them to justice and uh, to bring the just to, to bring the perpetrators of human rights violations to justice and it's a kind of uh, i mean from one hand more and more uh, duties uh, from another hand less responsibility which uh, considers by the authorities by the law enforcement bodies as a green light mm -hmm. for continued violations of human rights so in general the situation is quite worse uh, regarding the human rights and we see it in from different areas uh, from what's going on with uh, protest actions and protesters uh, on the street what's what we are having uh, in the penitentiary system uh, what we have uh, regarding the environmental organizations and environmental rights and many other aspects um, in the field of uh, human rights and freedoms. So what, what are some of the risks that uh, individuals that are engaged in this work, what, what, what are some of the risks that they face? Uh, different type of the risk. Uh, first, it's a uh, threat and uh, actual violence, physical violence against the uh, human rights activists uh, and uh, human rights defenders. Uh, the second is a threat uh, uh, to, to become um, under criminal prosecution on different articles, uh, but, uh, some, uh, but it's obvious that the perse persecution is because of human rights work. Uh, the third type of uh, um, risks uh, are concerns uh, are regarding uh, um, or connected to, to the legislation on foreign agents, on undesirable organizations. And here we have uh, many new restrictions. Uh, and uh, if uh, anyone not follow these restrictions or these uh, provisions in the law, uh, they are in the risk uh, to have uh, huge fines mm -hmm. and later on uh, to be under criminal prosecution. So different type of the risks uh, are not in the place uh, for human rights defenders. Given these risks, are, are there sources of emotional and psychological support uh, for those who, who take on these risks? Uh, good question. I mean, there are some programs uh, which helps people uh, working in human rights uh, to somehow um, to feel better mm -hmm. because uh, in, in the situation then uh, legislation is getting worse uh, the situation is getting worse uh, the court system the justice system is does not work properly uh, people are working on human rights issues people are uh, exhausted burned out and emotionally emotionally exhausted mm -hmm. and it's very much important to, to have such programs which help people to somehow recover and continue the work to have a possibility for brief uh, uh, rest i would say but uh, not enough uh, definitely not enough uh, such programs in russia and in place uh, and uh, because of all these uh, pandemic restrictions uh, uh, the programs which are in place in other countries are also become not much available for us because of these uh, travel restrictions and uh, now the situation is a little bit better because uh, some countries are uh, started to accept uh, foreigners uh, and uh, all these restrictions are not as serious as uh, they were uh, during the previous year but still it's uh, more difficult uh, uh, to attend some rehabilitation program or recovering program outside of Russia than it was uh, several years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so thinking back, uh, beginning in 1992 and, and looking at your experience, 
Um, what could you comment on the role of Western funders in Russia? Uh, from my point of view, Western partner uh, funders uh, played uh, the crucial role for creation and developing uh, civil society in Russia and in particular human rights work in Russia. Uh, and, it's what, uh, and it was not only uh, because of resources or grants or, or donations uh, provided by foreign funders, but also because of other programs which have been um, carried out uh, by the foreign funders and helped uh, human rights organizations uh, to become more effective, more sustainable, uh, more um, organizational development uh, and uh, uh, to get knowledge how to think strategically and things like that. So uh, yeah, the brief answer is the role was tremendous and the role was uh, very much important for uh, developing uh, human rights uh, movement uh, in Russia. And so now, um, given that there is no longer Western funding, uh, or, or what there is is very tiny, um, so what kind of community support is there for human rights organizations in Russia, sort of, sort of local support for their work? Uh, there is some support, uh, but uh, I would say that it's not as big as uh, we would like to see it. But again, uh, looking at uh, the perspective of uh, several years back from uh, uh, today, I would say that uh, support from the community is getting bigger. Is it correct to say? I mean, we're receiving more and more support from the community. It's still not enough and uh, could be much bigger than uh, we have in place. But even if we look uh, at uh, such initiatives like uh, Over the Info, which uh, uh, monitors uh, protest activity and uh, helps uh, protesters uh, to um defend their rights uh, in the court uh, and uh, many other things regarding uh, protest activity in Russia they are receiving quite a huge amount of support uh, from the community and not only um, financial support from the community but also uh, people are quite active in sharing news, uh, in discussing news, uh, which uh, over the info is publishing and things like that. Uh, for the, another example is uh, our organization, Public Verdict Foundation. Uh, some years ago, we, I mean, if we compare to what we had some years ago, uh, today, uh, the support we are receiving from the community is uh, much bigger than uh, several years ago. And it's again, uh, uh, we see it from donations, uh, uh, we see it uh, from how people react uh, on information they are publishing, uh, how they are active in the discussion of uh, our news, uh, and uh, reports uh, and our assessments of uh, the situation and what's going on in Russia. And uh, for us, it's a, a quite important sign that what we are doing is the right things. Mm -hmm. And how we are doing is, uh, again, it's a, we are in the right way. Uh, and do it, and we do it professionally, and uh, people see that we help uh, others uh, and uh, willing to, uh, to 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 support us. Mm -hmm. For example, last year when we've been fined uh, by the court uh, for not mentioning in several of our publications that we are foreign agents, although all this mentioning been in place. Uh, and we uh, published the information that we are fined and the 
amount of the fines is quite huge and we are not able to pay it uh, from the budget we are have because it's, uh, uh, you know very well, if we are receiving, uh, uh, re receiving support from, from the foundations, uh, the budget is quite defined and there is no uh, items for fines uh, to the um, state treasurer. So we asked people to support us and we collected uh, um, needed amount from the, uh, from the people. So people supported us and that was a quite uh, uh, happy moment for us and quite a good sign that uh, really what we are doing is a, is a right and people see it and people trust us and uh, people want us uh, to continue our work. Excellent. Well, that's a credit to the professionalism of your organization. Uh, that's terrific. Um, do you notice it, uh, a difference between sort of the cities and the regions in terms of community support? Of course, there are differences. Uh, uh, again, uh, um, I mean, but the, the differences are have different nature if we mm -hmm. compare to what I explained before then uh, uh, many organizations in the big cities and uh, only one organization if any exists uh, in the smaller uh, regions. Uh, here I would say that in the regions uh, organizations are more visible for the people because mm -hmm. they're I mean they're only one and uh, all human rights work uh, done in the region is conducted by one single organization or the group of uh, enthusiasts uh, or pe enthusiastic people. So they are more visible, but at the same time, people are more afraid in small cities uh, to support human rights work. Because they are also, I mean, the uh, ordinary people is also more visible uh, in in the small uh, regions and mm -hmm. can more easily become uh, the target for any uh, threatens, uh, punishing, uh, and things like that. So I would say people in small regions are less supportive for human rights, not because uh, they do not believe in what human rights organizations are doing, but because uh, they are more afraid of uh, uh, con consequences uh, for of such support. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, um, so thinking, thinking about uh, threats and enforcement uh, issues, I, I'm wondering about the courts in Russia and, and how independent from the executive branch uh, are, do you, do you think the courts are? Independent. Independent, uh, yes. Uh, my assessment that uh, Russian court system is not independent at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there are cases which consider it more or less uh, in accordance uh, to the principle of uh, fair trial. Uh, but uh, um, we have uh, a lot of cases uh, where there are a lot of violations uh, uh, if we, I mean, assess how the court proceedings is going on. Uh, from the point of view of fair trial principles. And if we are talking about political uh, cases or political motivated cases, uh, no independence at all. Mm -hmm. If we are talking about, uh, for example, cases uh, regarding foreign agents uh, legislation or undesirable organizations legislation, uh, no independence uh, at all. Uh, so if we are going, if we are talking about uh, cases against uh, uh, peaceful demonstrators who've been arrested during the peaceful demonstrations and uh, uh, fined by the court for the violation of the law on uh, um, demonstrations, uh, 
uh, and other public actions, uh, we can see only single cases, only few cases where uh, courts been acted in accordance with the fair trial principles. But we have thousands of cases during the year where such principles have been violated. So I can't say, I mean, all these uh, are the obvious uh, for me that uh, court system in Russia is not independent, is not working uh, in accordance with the fair trial principles. Uh, and uh, if the situation would change with the court system, many, many problems will become less, uh, less problematic in the country. And so what's, what's the role of the European Court of Human Rights in Russia right now? Huh. Good question. And again, no simple answer. <laughs> and uh, I mean, from one hand, uh, there is the opinion that uh, the role of the European Court of Human Rights is uh, quite tiny, small, little. Uh, and uh, Russia is only paying compensation. Uh, in some cases, uh, implement individual measures and uh, doing almost nothing in terms of uh, general measures. Uh, at the same uh, time, um, other experts, and I would agree with uh, this uh, uh, group of experts, saying that uh, judgments uh, by the European Court, Court of Human Rights uh, actually making difference in some areas of our life. And uh, we can see these uh, changes uh, uh, in the area of uh, uh, mental health, uh, mm -hmm. even in the area of uh, uh, in the area regarding the conditions in the penitentiary system, if we compare it to what we had in 90s in the pretrial detention centers and what we have now, it's a quite different situations. And the situation is getting better. And I believe that uh, uh, judgments made by the European Court of Human Rights played the role in such changes and uh, in some other areas. So the answer is in the middle. Uh, we, we, we would love to have more impact from the judgments uh, made by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, but uh, we have some impact and not only because of compensation, Although in some cases, even compensation is a big deal for victims of human rights violations. Uh, but the uh, answer is in the middle. Okay, in the middle, right? Yeah, in, in the middle. Uh, we would like to have yeah. uh, the more impact mm -hmm. of the judgments, uh, but uh, uh, the real situation is that on some judgments, uh, results are. Uh, I mean, in result, uh, La Russian authorities made changes and the situation is improved. On another judgment, uh, we're still waiting for such changes uh, and they're not happening. And the situation is continued to be quite uh, difficult. For example, in uh, regarding the um, torture and prohibition of torture, uh, we have uh, dozens of uh, judgments uh, made by the European Court of Human Rights uh, and Russia is only paying compensation to the victims, not general measures taken, in, uh, taken by the authorities, uh, not even implemented uh, uh, like uh, future steps. Uh, uh, by the authorities and the situation is not changing actually uh, to, 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 to the better way, to, mm -hmm. to the better. 
Right. Um, so that then now thinking more broadly ab about the future, uh, so, so what, what do you think the future holds for human rights in Russia? <sighs> it's a question it's a for several question. hours <laughs> to answer. <laughs> uh, but I would say that uh, human rights uh, always uh, was not an easy topic for Russia. Uh, and uh, we, I mean, even compared to what we had uh, 50 years ago, the situation is better than 50 years ago. At least we can, we still able to work openly mm -hmm. and uh, uh, help people. Uh, even in the courts in some cases. So from these perspectives, uh, the situation is a bit better than uh, during the Soviet Union time. Uh, at the same time, what we are see now and, uh, um, and what assessments uh, are made by the experts and what trends we see during the uh, previous uh, several years, and especially during the East, uh, uh, East year before the um, Duma elections, I would say for the short period of time, uh, the situation uh, with human rights uh, would not be getting better, uh, even some uh, more difficulties uh, will be faced by us. And more work, and we'll have more work to do. But we are always uh, hoping for the better future, and I also hope for the better future and hope to see Russia in several decades. Uh, the human rights are respected and uh, uh, observed by the authorities. So let's hope for it. So that's a very hope. That's a very hopeful way to to end our time. Uh, I, I I wish we could continue, but uh, I'm afraid that that we've reached the end of our time. Uh, I I want to thank you so much for giving us the benefit of your extensive experience and leadership in the development of of human rights law and practice in in Russia. And I also want to thank you for doing this interview in English. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mary, for the very interesting questions and a good conversation. Thank you, Natalia. It's, it's very good to see you again. Yeah, for me also.